I would also recommend sort of just following your interest and being okay with that, even if that leads you to some places that might be unpredictable, might not make sense to a casual observer, uh, might not even make sense to you at first. Welcome to another episode of Learning by Living, the podcast about people who learn outside of conventional school. I want to read you something written by today's guest. Quote, I was relaxed homeschooled from kindergarten to 12th grade, started attending college at age 18, and am now a first semester senior in college, currently holding a 3.96 cumulative GPA. I'm also a classical and acoustic guitarist, singer, songwriter, and published writer. End quote. That was written in October 2017 by today's guest, Ben Riley for Tipping Points Magazine. And since writing that, he's gotten that bachelor's degree in classical guitar performance, works as a musician and teacher in New York City, and has started his master's degree in music theory. And I didn't mention yet that he is the son of the co-host of this show, Gina Riley. So I sat down with both Ben and his mother, Gina, to talk about the following things. How Ben spent and learned during his formative years. How those years helped him develop his passion for guitar and other things. And how he transitioned into more formal learning spaces like Berklee College of Music and then going on to an undergraduate degree. So I hope you enjoyed today's episode and our talk about how Ben learned various things and what the transition was like into college and things like that. Enjoy. Hey, Ben. Hey, Gina. Hi. Hi. We're going to talk about unschooling. We're going to talk about, I guess you call it in one of your articles, relaxed homeschooling. And uh, we're going to talk about kind of how all of this got you to where you are now as a professional guitarist and a professional uh, teacher and stuff like that. So the first question I have actually, um, after looking at the articles that you've written, and of course, talking to, to Gina a lot, is why unschooling? because it really wasn't on anyone's radar in the year 2000. Why did you get to a point where you figured, well, it might just be best to learn at home and maybe without formal curriculum? Should I answer? Okay, I'll answer first. Um, I think for me, it was an individual decision for my own child. Um, At the time, he knew his alphabet. He knew his numbers. He was really interested at like like four and a half, five at the periodic table. And I'm just like at the sandbox watching him play. And I'm just like, why would I send this this person to kindergarten? Right? Like, is there a need? Um, and that was really the big question. Like, why? He was also a quirky kid. I think you would even admit mm-hmm. it. Like, we're, we're both am. quirky. Still are quirky people. Um, and so there was just this whole, like, question of why. What are the reasons why? And I couldn't think of a good reason. Um, and so that really started the journey into homeschooling and unschooling, learning through play, learning through life. And that's how mm-hmm. it worked out for me. And we've made that decision every year. Like, like we would, we had yep. make that every, decision. Every year we would sit down, we would think about it. There were all the options on the table, I think. Mm-hmm. Every year it was, do you want to go to school? Do you not want to go to school? And every year you chose not to. Mm-hmm. And it just happened that way. I think some years, and we'll talk about it, I think some years you probably were considering the other options. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So you can answer that question. Um, about the, the transition points where I was considering school? No, about like why, why oh, yeah, well, well, let's see. So the, so the beginning would be a little bit early for me to talk about just because I was so little. Um, I don't remember consciously, but I would say the main thing was I just wanted to learn what I wanted to learn and I wanted to explore things. I didn't want there to be timetables on what I'm learning. Like if I'm learning geology, I want to be able to, I wanted to be able to spend, you know, three or four hours looking at the periodic table. If I, I got into, so with me, I get into a lot of phases. So I got into this phase where all I would do is study the periodic table or all I would do is study Greek myths or all I would do is study, you know, golf or the golf swing or, you know, chords on a guitar or whatever. Um, and I would just spend a lot of time doing that through the day. Like I would spend a whole, whole days on this and that would be something I definitely would not be able to do in any kind of, you know, regular school. Um, so that was the main thing, just being able to learn what I wanted to learn when I wanted to learn it. Um, and then I would also say another great thing about it is I feel like I've been able to get to know my family better as a result too, because I'm, I'm, I'm around them throughout the day and I get to, you know, watch them make decisions, watch them do everyday things. And I think there's a lot of learning to be had there. Um, that's, that's helped me then and continues to help me now. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that goes for better or for worse, right? Because in a whole unschooling environment, you can't escape when things are happening within your family Mm -hmm. or when, you know, Mm -hmm. issues come up, like you can't escape. And so Mm -hmm. you learn to like navigate through those waters. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's probably a helpful thing rather than to be sheltered from those waters. So any examples you can think of of times when the waters did get choppy and and how did that work (laughs) oh so many oh where do we begin (laughs) sorry you 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 opened the door Uh, let's see yeah right hmm well i think it started when we started homeschooling (laughs) um yeah you know my grandparents were against it my aunt was against it all of our neighbors were against it pretty much everyone we knew was against it and that was a lot to navigate um and it was something that if I'd went to school, it just wouldn't have been an issue. You know, no one would have thought that, so oh, he's doing what he's supposed to do. He's going to school, you know, whatever. You know, as a result, people would question me just randomly. So we are homeschooled. Oh, I used to hate that. And it would always be from a nasty old lady to so we are homeschooled. <laughs> just like that. Um, and, then, and, then, and then they would ask, so how do you learn this? And what do you learn? And, and then they would test me on things. So what is two plus three or you know, where, where on the map is the United States or whatever. And um, there would just be this incessant questioning. And to be honest, it was a real pain in the neck. It was probably the biggest downside of homeschooling, actually, is just having to deal with that. For, for out pretty much from age five until I would say 16 or 17, when I'm, not coincidentally, I started attending formal schooling and started working. So yeah. I, I guess that made me more normal. But um, yeah. So that's one example, and uh, yeah, I I could go on and on. I think, yeah, I mean, I think the thing is, like, so I think of that example, right, the challenges of having neighbors knock at your door and be like, what color is my shirt? right like when he was four and things this would like, happen pretty I mean this would too. really happen you know this would actually happen it's hard to believe in 2019 but we had neighbors who would test you on multiplication everything 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 wow. um wow. it was it was almost scary right um and then I think we Ben and I um were by ourselves for 11 years I got married when he was 11 years old. And so we were navigating the transition of moving into a new home and blending a new family. And I think that was definitely like a hard transition. Um, You know, my husband wasn't an actual fan of homeschooling at the time. Now he's probably one of the greatest proponents of it, um, but not a fan. And so it was a hard transition there. He was sick, he got cancer. So we homeschooled through cancer, through stem cell, all the while I'm working and going to school, you know, and, and raising a family. So, I mean, I think there were, you saw life. Mm-hmm. You were not shielded from any of it. Um, and I think that's made you the person who you are today, for better or for worse, mm-hmm. right? I would like, say that's true, yeah. Um, but it's also, there's also a social-emotional component to that. We talk in schools about social-emotional learning. And I think in homeschooling, like, that's that's part of the package, right? Like, that's part of the deal in unschooling. You, you watch what's going on in your family. You try to navigate it all. And through it, you become healthier and healthier as a person because you learn resilience. You learn grit. You learn things that everyone wants you to learn in school. Going back to the, the learning side of it earlier in terms of like the academic stuff, I'm sure there's a lot of skeptics of unschooling who would be shocked to hear what you said earlier. Like, I just wanted to spend hours looking at the periodic table. So I have to ask you um, the question that I'm sure they would ask. What would possess someone to spend <laughs> hours looking at the periodic table or studying? Well, a golf swing may be more obvious because it's not academic but yeah, let's look at the, like the periodic table. Do you remember what it was that fascinated, like that got a hold of you with well, that? For the periodic table, I would just, you know, see the world around me and I wanted to know how it was constructed. I've, I've always been a very analytic sort of person. So when I look at something, I always think, how is this constructed? How does this, you know, sort of work? Um, and it's interesting because I'm a music theory major now and I, I love music theory and that's what led me to theory. But anyway, backing up to the periodic table, I just wanted to know, like, what are all these things made of? What is the grass made of? What are trees made of? What are rocks made of? What is soil made of? And I I learned that they were made of elements, and I wanted to naturally know what these elements were. And um, that that sort of led me to that. I know it probably seems bizarrely academic to some people, but for me, it was just sort of, I just want to know about this. And it was just just curiosity and a natural sense of interest, I guess, Um, it's kind of hard to put into words, but 
Uh, yeah, I always wonder if one of the big mistakes we make with schooling is that when we tell, say that, let's say the periodic table is just part of science and you do science at school and it's this activity you do at school. If we in some ways send kids the wrong message of like, this isn't stuff that you should be doing or could be doing outside of school. This isn't fun. This isn't interesting. This is just something you have to know. And for you, it sounded like it was just a way to figure something out. That's right. Yeah, and that's been true for pretty much all of the subjects that I've studied. Yeah, so, so what are some of the other ones? Let's see. So you periodic table, there was a golf swing you mentioned. Yep. Um, geology, I think, came up in one of our previous yep. conversations. So geology right? came, came out of my interest in the periodic table. Okay, so you and looked at the periodic table and then kind of branched out into geology and, and studying kind of like, I guess it's applied chemistry. I mean, I guess that's what they would call it, but I don't know. Yeah, um, yeah so geology was p partly the study of the periodic table and partly also just w taking walks in nature. We used to take lots of nature walks, go to museums, go to libraries. Um, and I just sort of got interested in rocks and, and the patterns in them. I'm, I'm, a bit, I'm really into patterns, as you might be able to tell. Um, and so I would just look at these patterns and I'd want to know what the crystal structures were called, what the rocks were called. I wanted to be able to identify them and understand them. That sort of led me to um, geology. Like I think, I don't know, when I was like maybe six or seven, I was reading like a college level geology textbooks. And I wasn't reading it front to back, just parts I was interested in. And that just wasn't, I didn't even think twice about it. Only now I'm, I'm reading this book. It was funny. I, I looked, we were cleaning out our um, books earlier this year and I was going through and I was like, wait a minute, I actually read this at like seven. This, this looks so involved, you know, but you know, for me, it was just part of it was just, I'm interested in this. I want to learn more about it. This is this information that will help me um, understand. And I, there's less of a distinction between school and not, and not school. And, you know, learning isn't seen as something that happens in a classroom. It's just part of, part of life, you know, to live is to learn. I think I say in one of my articles and, that really is my life philosophy, probably. Yeah. So let's then talk about reading, because you just mentioned, you know, reading at a very early age, what is probably college level, you know, kind of philosophy thing that maybe undergraduates would be exposed to. Again, I'm pretty sure that skeptics would be pretty shocked at something like that. So as best you can remember, um, how did you learn to read? All right. So again, it was pretty much a natural progression. Um, I mean, everyone in my family at the time were avid readers, and I would see people reading the newspaper, reading books, you know, reading magazines, and I just thought that's what people did. I mean, I didn't really, I didn't really think about it. I don't know. I mean, there was, I was surrounded by books thanks to my mom and family, and I just sort of started just trying to figure it out. Um, it's hard to give like a like a you know progression that that would would make more sense. Um, yeah, I just started, started reading, started reading, um, and I don't think I did any formal phonics stuff. I mean, I might have sounded out words if I didn't know how, how they were sounded, and I might have, I don't know, read, read some easier books, but then again, no. I mean, I didn't really read in a progression, like people say, you know, when you're in first grade, you should read first grade books, second grade, second grade books, and I, I know this substitute teacher, and I hear this stuff all the time, and I'm, I, I, don't, I don't even respond to it, because I don't even know what to say, you know? The issue of the old text, right? Yeah, it's like, I mean, like as adults, I mean, we all read stuff that's below and above our level. You know, we don't really think about that. But we, so for me, it just wasn't a question of level. It was just, what am I interested in? What do I need to know? Where are the books that can teach me that? And then sometimes it was just, what's a good story that I like? Maybe I like this story, you know, in the case of fiction or fantasy. Well, um, in an earlier conversation before the podcast that we didn't record, I think, uh, Gina, you had said something like there was really no middle point. Like there was like, we introduced, yeah, like there's these basic books and that kind of like to introduce reading, but then it's like there was no middle point between that and the other stuff. So can you yeah. talk about that a little bit? Yeah, in the 90s and two, early 2000s, like Bob books were really big for homeschoolers. Um, they rhymed, they were simple words. So I was like, oh, let me let me buy some Bob books, right? So um, he was already like reading and, and interested in text and books. So I just thought that this would be interesting, right? Um, I wasn't doing it for any sort of like goal. It was just sort of like, oh, everyone else is getting them. So let me try. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think you started on the Bob books. 
And really, truly, I can't remember like going from Bob books to like anything mid ground. Mm -hmm. I remember you going from Bob books to C.S. Lewis. I don't remember you having any intermediate. Um, and I always think that's interesting, right? I was read like I was reading you, Clifford, and I was I was re like we had gone through that stage and and um, a lot of the different books, but I don't remember it going from like Bob books to intermediate books to C.S. Lewis. I remember going from Bob books to C.S. Lewis, mm -hmm. um, and you trying to figure out the words in the Lion Witch in the Wardrobe. Um, so there was no. I mean, I guess you could say there was, you know, Bob books were phonetic. Um, so there was a little bit of phonics in there, but, but I don't remember anything like a middle ground or an intermediate level for Ben. And I think that you would probably say the same about yourself and mm -hmm. your learning style. I mean, now. that's pretty much been a cornerstone of how I learn at pretty much anything. And it endlessly surprises people because I spend a little bit more time at the beginning stage than most people. And then I just jump to, to a pretty, you know, high level, I guess people would, would call. I don't even think in terms of high or low levels, to be honest. I just think of learning stuff and figuring things out and wanting to understand, wanting to learn more. And when, when you were, um, I guess, puzzling through the words in the C.S. Lewis book that you didn't understand, it's probably more of a question for, that your mom can answer. Um, what did that look like? Did, did he usually ask for, like, what does this mean? How, can you help me with this? Or was it more like, no, I'm just going to figure this out? Yeah, it was like a puzzle to be solved. Um, yeah. So I, like we would read together frequently mm -hmm. and I think that you probably took the book independently and it was like a puzzle to be solved. And then when we would read together frequently, it would be, um, oh, that makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. And so I don't know how like puzzle and oh, that makes sense. I don't know how that came to be in the middle. Um, but yeah, I think it was more of a puzzle that made sense eventually through reading and through like us reading together and things like that. Wow. Was there ever a point during your kind of unschooling experience where you wanted to go to school or you thought about like, hey, everyone else is going to school. I wonder what this is about and what happened? <laughs> yes. So I was around 12 years old and my Grandparents were telling me I was missing out. My aunt was telling me I was missing out. My friends were telling me I was missing out. My so naturally, you're missing out. So naturally, <laughs> I mean, I'm 12 years old. You tell a 12 year old they're missing out. They want to know what they're missing out on, you know. And um, so yeah, I I sort of rebelled a little bit and was interested in school. And to be honest, the main reason why I didn't attend school is because I was too lazy to look into any of the options. I, <laughs> Um, I'm too busy looking at geology. You know, I wish I could say I've made an informed decision and I looked at all of my options and I decided to continue homeschooling. But really, I continued homeschooling probably just out of laziness because I didn't even want to like look into the options, go to the schools, talk to the people in charge of the schools or anything like that. So yeah. it was more just an, an external pressure that I almost yielded to, but ultimately didn't, and probably, to be honest, out of laziness more than anything else. And I just liked being able to sleep late and do what I wanted to do. Um, yeah. Yeah. And at some point, you discovered what would later become your passion and later become your career, which is guitar. Um, how, did you, how did you come across guitar, and what did that look like in terms of developing it into a passion? Okay. That's a, that's a good question. So I um, started kind of by fluke. Um, as I was saying earlier, my mom had gotten a guitar and started taking lessons. And at first, she would ask me if I want lessons. I'd be like, no, I, I, I don't like the guitar. I don't want to learn guitar. Um, and then there was a the couple days later on where I'd be like, can you show me how to do that? You know, my mom would play a chord, but like, can you show me how to do it? It's like, I can't show you how to do that. I'm just learning it myself, but I'll, I'll, I'll happily pay for lessons for you. I'll sign you up for a month and you see if you like it. And I was resistant at first, but eventually I'm like, okay, fine. You know, remember, I was 13, so I was, I was, I was a little bit moody. Um, probably a lot moody. My mom could, could attest to that. Um, and so I was like, fine, I'll learn guitar. And then I had a really great teacher and he, um, he showed me the, his love of music and also he showed me that it could be a great way to express yourself to create something and i just fell in love with it probably within the first couple of weeks to a month of it i would say and with guitar as with 
the, uh, the different topics we were talking about, there was no midpoint. I went from barely playing a G chord to playing bar chords and Led Zeppelin riffs. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't a linear progression at all, which puzzled my guitar teacher as much as anyone, but um, he kind of flowed a bit, which is cool. And, and then I, I just sort of gradually started playing gigs and then um, pursued more formal instruction. First, I went to Berkeley, did a certificate program there. Um, and while there, I learned a lot of, a lot of theory and a lot about how the fretboard worked and figuring out the chords and scales and, and more of that, um, I guess, theoretical formal background. And then from there, I, I had, I ended up uh, learning classical guitar to study at Nyack College. Um, and again, I'm I'm going through this very quickly. I can I can expand on these if you'd like, but and then. From there, it sort of evolved into my current career where I teach private lessons, I substitute teach, I perform, and, um, and I'm a grad student. And it just sort of just led me there for, I guess, an organic process, you could say. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't like just one day I want to do this. It was sort of a gradual, hmm, I like this. This is great. I love this. I really want to do this. How can I make a career of it, you know? Yeah, there's, there's a few things that really stand out to me that, that I'd love to like get elaboration on. So the first one is you mentioned, uh, so Gina, you were learning guitar and that's kind of how Ben picked up on it. And it must have been pretty intriguing to know that your mom couldn't teach you these things because she's learning it herself. It just reminds me of something that, you know, unschooling kind of advocate and pioneer John Holt used to say about like live in front of your children. And like if you want to, you know, expose them to something, just like let them see you doing it. And that's all you need. So it seems like that's an important element. It's so interesting because there's a definition. I really had to pause at that definition. There's a definition of unschooling that talks about, you know, all the parents have to provide is exposure. And sometimes Ooh. that um, makes me pause because I think, and, and people think, well, what if you don't live in an environment that is academic? Or what if you don't live in an environment where your mom you know, wants to play the guitar, has like intrinsic motivation for, for music or something? Um, or what if you don't live in an environment with lots of books, right? Um, I think exposure and the word exposure comes in different forms. Um, we were actually at a very low socioeconomic status when we started unschooling. Um, we were very poor. <laughs> we didn't know it, but we were very poor. I had no idea. Uh, yeah, many no, years later. No, I mean, yeah. we used libraries and museums and I did all I could to expose um, but we did not have any money whatsoever. Um, and so I cringe when I hear like exposure because I think, well, people are going to say, yeah, unschooling is great for those who can provide the environment for a, you know, premier learning experience. But that's really not what it was at all. It was sort of like I was taking lessons because I was working so much and going to school so much. I just needed to like do something that was fun. And he saw me like practicing and then like became like, oh, that's interesting. And I was like, yeah, I can't teach you because this is one thing I don't know anything about, right? Like I'm struggling myself. Um, so yeah, that exposure thing in that environment, I mean, I think it sounds beautiful and it's probably true in many aspects. Um, but I also think we have to say it with care because the environments that you were exposed to when you were younger were all the environments that were free. So if there was a free museum day or a free zoo day, those are the ones we went to. If like the library was a huge resource. Mm -hmm. And those are great habits that have served me well throughout life. I mean, especially as a musician, you know, I'm far from rich myself. And um, knowing how to live frugally and well, I think was a really valuable lesson. Yeah. Yeah. And then the other thing that you mentioned uh, about kind of the guitar experience was that you at some point decided you wanted to take formal lessons. And then after that, you decided you wanted to get some formal experience, the uh, Berkeley College of Music, kind of a structured program, stuff like that. So I'm curious as what to, what the transition was was like from kind of figuring out how to learn things on your own through books or whatever to being told, OK, practice this for next week come in, perform it, stuff like that. Was it a hard transition? Was it an easy transition? Mm. You know, in many ways, the, it was a pretty easy transition. And the reason why it was, was because it was something that I was interested in and wanted to do. Um, I never felt forced or pressured to do higher education. So I always saw it as, as a choice. Um, 
the reason why I got into it, there were two reasons. One, I wanted to see what, what I could benefit from a more formal learning environment. And the second thing was I knew it would give me a little bit more legitimacy, which would probably get those people off my back who keep asking me about my homeschooling. Um, to, be on, to be totally honest, that was a concern at the time. Um, and so the combination of those two things sort of led me to it. There were challenges, but it, it was, it was very, relatively smooth. Like, for instance, I had to learn to be a better note taker. I had to improve my handwriting. Um, I had to listen in a different way, listen for what's due next week as opposed to whatever train of thought ha the professor says that happens to be interesting to me, you know, that sort of thing. But other than that, I feel like it was a smooth transition. Um, and something I want to, I do want to say about this is that I think my educational experience has allowed me to sort of pursue any, anything I want to do, um, no matter how formal or informal, I have the tools I need to learn what I need to learn to do it. And I think that that is probably the most valuable thing I've learned and something that has and will continue to help me throughout my life, I, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wonder, um, do you feel like having the unschooling background and kind of having to learn how to learn things put you at any advantage or disadvantage relative to other folks? Like when you went into those structured programs and other people had gone through a more formal process? Do you feel like there were any advantages or disadvantages that you had? Well, the main advantage was that I wasn't jaded by quote unquote learning. I didn't see a separation between learning in the classroom and learning through life. For me, it was just a different way of learning, a different approach. And I want to learn all the different approaches I can get and see which ones are most helpful to me. Um, and I've still found a blend of a formal and informal approach works best for me, even in the more informal aspects of my learning. Like in my daily guitar practice, for instance, I mean, I'm, I have a list of goals. I have certain pieces that I work on, certain technical exercises. So in that sense, it's very formal, but I also make time for improvisation and songwriting and more creative aspects as well. And that, yeah. but it, so I would say the biggest advantage is I can just learn whatever I need to learn whenever I need to learn it or want to learn it. And I wasn't jaded by the learning you know, in a formal setting, I didn't have 12 years of it, of the baggage already on me, you know, I was coming in sort of fresh, new um, to, to that environment. The only disadvantage I could think of is that I just wasn't used to the environment. It was a new environment. So I had to learn the rules of the environment, you know, taking, like I said, taking notes, improving my handwriting, listen for, listening for what's due next week, making sure I know what's due next week, um, all of that. But it was a pretty smooth transition. Um, and overall, I found it to be an advantage. So, and then at some point you decided you wanted to go to college. And part of that, of course, was because it would give you kind of a credential of legitimacy. Mm -hmm. And then part of it was probably that there's a learning benefit to it. But, okay, so how, how do you go about that process, right? You haven't been through K-12. Mm -hmm. You have to go to, you have to apply, you have to show them that you have whatever academic merit they want to see. So what is the, what's the process? Where did you start? What was that process like? Um, well, I would say the, the first thing that I did, um, which people have told me is very different from a typical approach is I contacted the Dean of the program that I was interested in and scheduled a time to meet with him and just talk about the program. Um, and that, that helped me a lot in terms of just building rapport with people in the program and also getting to know if the program was right for me. Um, the dean was a very, very brilliant man, very, very kind man, and he sort of walked me through the, the process, and I had some questions for him, and we talked for about an hour and a half or so. And that, real, that really helped a lot in, in terms of the overall process. Um, he explained some components of the process, but also just being, just already knowing someone there was helpful. Um, and in terms of admissions, I remember they were initially skeptical. I think I had what did I have to do? I don't know. I had to like send them some kind of like portfolio like thing to show that I had skills, I guess. Had you been keeping a portfolio uh, along the way? Cause New York state, yeah, I don't know what the rules are there. Quarterly report. So you, yeah. quarter, so. So you had had something to send them already. You didn't have to go back and, and kind of like play catch up. Right. Generally. Yeah. yeah. I mean, New York state, we had to keep quarterly reports and then end of the year reports. And I had kept those, um, 
they also at the end of homeschooling give you a note that said, okay, like you have finished mm -hmm. your program of study. That was immensely from, helpful, actually. Yeah, that was immensely Ironically, helpful. That like they, letter. Yeah, yeah. And it wasn't yeah. like a diploma or anything. It was literally mm -hmm. just a letter that said you had you had finished your program of study from age six to 16, which is mandatory in New York, you know, good luck on your future endeavors. It wasn't a, anything, it was a one or two sentence letter. Um, but I think that letter was really important. I think they asked for that letter. They did, okay. So, but you, I'm assuming that you had to take something like the SAT or the ACT. You didn't, okay, okay. They originally, um, they originally wanted me to, and I believe it made me an el ineligible for one form of financial aid, but it wasn't a problem. Okay. I was eligible for other forms of it. And, and then did you have to take uh, like undergraduate level certain academic classes? And if so, like were there, were there any gaps when you came into any of these classes saying, I, I don't know that, I need to learn that, and maybe other people in the class might have known those things? Or Not in terms of music. Um, generally, but in more in terms of getting used to the classroom environment. Um, like, it, like all the stuff I mentioned, um, and I won't repeat it again, but basically just, just getting used to the rules of engagement in a classroom, to, for, uh, for lack of a better word. That was really the only thing that I came in not knowing that other people knew. Um, and I feel like I came in knowing a lot more than my peers, which kind of surprised me a little bit, but that... That is what I, I had found. I think yeah. that a lot of times when we're talking about college admissions, people think that homeschoolers have to take some sort of like remedial math course mm -hmm. or remedial, right. you know, ELA right. course to... Yeah, there were no, uh, no remedial There were courses. no remedial courses. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were no um, undergrad requirements that you needed, that you didn't mm -hmm. take. And mm -hmm. I think... Um, and a lot of my Berkeley tr credits transferred over as well. Yeah. <laughs> I, I remember hearing one of his professors, which is so interesting, um, after the fact, after he had graduated, uh, one of his professors had expressed what a wonderful writer you were. And this is after graduation, right? Like, because in college, you know, like, you're on your own. Like, I have nothing to do with this. So after graduation, I, like, shook hands with one of your professors, and one of your professors expressed what a beautiful writer you were. And, I mean, I was like, really right <laughs> like, like in a sense like really because the whole time um we were like unschooling it wasn't something you enjoyed or wasn't something you um really practiced at all so in hearing that I mean I practiced a little I mean you did you practiced it a little <laughs> um, <laughs> um but I think hearing that from someone who was a professor after the fact after you graduated um, was a really interesting thing for like a parent to hear, right? Um, because it was like, wow, this is something like, again, you didn't have any formal instruction on, and here you are publishing articles and are like an amazing writer. Um, so that to me was so interesting after the fact, right? Like in hindsight, I was like, whoa, really cool. Yeah, yeah, it's, that's an interesting process because most people in a K-12 environment would assume that if you're I won't say avoiding writing because you, you weren't avoiding it necessarily, but it wasn't something that you really wanted to do. What was it? What was it then that kind of clicked in terms of like writing and really like coming to enjoy this thing that before, you know, any casual observer would say, well, that's going to be a deficit because you're not working on it. Hmm. Again, it's hard to pinpoint a specific moment because um, it just happens kind of fluidly in a, in a way that no one really understands. To be honest, I'm not even sure I understand it. I just live it. Um, but anyway, um, so what happened? <laughs> what happened for me, I think, is just I had to write papers, and I just really applied myself and wanted to learn how to do it. I didn't really study models of it. I think also think that my love of reading helped me a lot, because from reading you learn how to. At least that's how I learned how to write mainly through reading good books, and you know, and not even paying attention to you know, oh, you use the possessive here, you use a verb here, a noun here. I, w I wasn't thinking of any of that, and I still don't when I write. I think of the idea I'm trying to get across, and I try to refine it and make it look and sound as good as possible. Um, and it's interesting, because I've, like, currently I've written six articles. I believe I have another one coming out later this year or early next year, and, you know, it's not really something that I ever really saw as a deficit or huge advantage and I'm actually surprised people think I'm a I'm a very good writer to be honest with you I mean I, I think yeah I'm good at what I do you know I don't know I'm, that's all right um 
I, I see it from a totally different perspective. So it's actually kind of enlightening to hear um, what that perspective might look like from the outside. Um, yeah. I'm trying to reflect on it. It's making me think of it a little bit differently, which I definitely appreciate. Yeah. From yeah. a parental point of view, I think if you looked and saw it, you're writing at age 14, 15, or 16, and saw the type of writer you are now, it would be inherently surprising um, from an academic point of view. I mean, as a parent, I was scared. That's the most, that was the part I was most scared of, right? That like you going into college were, we're going to be unprepared to write college papers and it ended up being your talent. And I have no idea how that happened because getting you to write a paragraph at 15 was like, <laughs> like, and it, it wasn't, wasn't that happening. it wasn't happening and it wasn't that it was formally asked either maybe once a year, but I was kind of like, you know, New York state has some stringent requirements. So I was kind of like, you know, like eventually you're going to be asked to like write something. So like, let's, you know, <laughs> can we like see if you can do it? <laughs> I think that also extends to different aspects of what it, what I do now, like for instance, I was a horrible scheduler as a teenager, just absolutely horrible. Um, I would be late for things, I'd miss things. I feel bad for my former teachers <laughs> in that sense. Um, but it's interesting because I don't think anyone would have said, oh, this person is going to be a good teacher or is, or is going to be good at um, like r running their own um, and, um, business, small business. Like, yeah. Oh like, yeah, the, the yeah. amount of scheduling that you have to do there and is right. yeah, that's like, remarkable. Yeah, I mean, I probably spend at least an hour a day scheduling um, prospective students in, talking to them, you know, scheduling out times, you know, doing, you know, working with the business side of it, and it's a very new skill for me. I had to sort of learn that, and I didn't learn much of it in college. It's something I've sort of had to develop on my own, and um, something I I. I keep trying to get better at and keep learning more about. But I don't think like if someone saw me as a kid or a teenager would think that person will be able to run their own business or that person will be able to teach or that person will be able to manage their time well. They'll be like, how will they ever do anything in life? You know, probably. I don't know. But for me, it's just when I need to learn it or want to learn it, I learn it. Are there any disadvantages in your view to, to having uh, gone through an unschooled process rather than go through like a formal education process? Well, the biggest disadvantage was having to deal with all the crap I got from people throughout that, that whole time, really. Um, disadvantage. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if you call it a disadvantage, but I'm less normal, whatever that means, you know, than other people. I mean, I, ha I have my quirks, I have my interests. Um, but honestly, I think as an adult, that served me more helpfully than anything, like in terms of teaching Actually, in terms of teaching, my on-schooling perspective has helped me so much because I have a very holistic, um, personalized approach to each student. I mean, mm. I, have, I have a progression of materials that I teach, but I don't always teach it in a straight line, and I take into account their own interests. Like in the first, first trial lesson, I'll always ask, what kinds of music do you want to learn? And some people, especially kids, are like, why are you asking me that? Like, I don't know. I don't know. I'm like, well, think about it. You know, what do you like? What do you listen to when you're in the car or, or on your phone or whatever? And it's a new concept for a lot of people. But I think having, being able to have that, that openness in terms of learning and teaching has served me well on both ends, both as someone who learns and teaches. Um, and also I'm able to learn a lot while I'm teaching because, because of that, because of that background and able to sort of look at each student in with you know fresh eyes i guess just not seeing okay they've learned this etude so they're going to do this one next week it's like well should we spend a little more time on this should we move forward a little bit faster and that sort of thing so that's helped me a lot um I'm, i may be digressing yeah no no i think that's i think that's good it's it also strikes me guitar and, and music in in general is interesting because if you're talking about like learning things non-linearly um, like it doesn't always have to go in a straight line and like guitar is a great example of that You know, like if we taught it in school, we'd start with the basics, mm -hmm. right? You have to learn how to play like a diatonic scale right. And you'd start there because you can't do anything unless you do the basics because that's how we teach reading and that's how we teach math And that's how we teach a lot of things and guitar it sounds like like if you can't play something cool at first Like you're not gonna make it through the diatonic scales exactly. and, uh, to get there Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's, it's almost like guitar is the ultimate, I don't want to say unstructured sort of learning, but it's definitely not linear. 
Yeah, definitely. Way. Didn't like, make it in I, school. Like, I mean, I was holding my pick the wrong way for the first two years. And wow. I was doing some cool stuff before that. And then I ended up having to correct the way I held my pick because I just couldn't advance. I couldn't play anything cool that I wanted to play that was harder than what I already knew you, holding the pick the wrong way. So I had to learn how to hold it correctly. Um, that would be one example of that. But yeah, that's, that's interesting. I never thought of it that way. Like I guess yeah. that could be sort of an unstructured pursuit in that sense. That's such an amazing analogy. Like I was holding the pick the wrong way. It's true. And I could but, you said, but you could still play. You could still you progress. You still play and mm -hmm. you can still progress. And then once you turn that pick around, a whole new world right. comes to you, right? Mm -hmm. like I mean, it did take me a little while to learn to hold the pick correctly. Maybe a, while, a lot longer than I, you know, sort of spent learning how to hold the pick. Yeah. But, I mean, it didn't set me back really. Once, once right. I it out. Um, and it's also, I think what, like, a, for instance, I have some adult students as well. And one of the things that'll stop them sometimes, and they're excellent, excellent students. I mean, they practice more than anyone and they love doing it. But sometimes they'll just, they'll be like, I don't feel like I'm progressing, in, you know, the way I want to. Or sometimes it'll be something like, I, I just feel like I can't do this until I get this right. And I'll be like, but you can. And, you know, I, I sort of have to have to convince them of that. And I, I'll... I think that can be a hard thing for kids as well. Like, like especially some of my teenage students will be like, well, am I really supposed to be learning this? And, and I'll be like, well, technically no, but I know you're ready for this. <laughs> um, so both as parent and an unschooler, um, what advice would you have for folks who are either currently unschooling or maybe deciding, like, is this something that could work? So I think treasure the time. Don't go into it with fear. Don't go into it afraid of um, what your child is or isn't going to learn, or if they are or aren't going to learn something at the right time. I mean, take all that fear away. Because um, on the other side, I can tell you that all that fear is completely unfounded, right? Like, um, enjoy the time, enjoy the learning, um, enjoy, enjoy what comes from it. Um, I think I had a lot of fear coming from outside, but also from inside. And I think somehow that kind of tainted the experience a little bit. Like you'll say the biggest challenge was all those people who were like mm -hmm. doubting us. And looking back, that really was the biggest challenge. The biggest challenge was navigating through a world that was unfriendly to unschoolers. Um, and what I will say is one of the reasons why I do the research I do, one of the reasons why I am the person I am is because I want to make that world more open to different learning experiences and more open to um, different types and ways of learning and different ways of like raising a kid. All right, let's see. I mean, I would say I don't feel qualified to give advice to parents, especially because I'm not one myself yet. Um, sure. But I will say just generally some things that I wish that I knew when I'd started would be not to listen as much to the people who just thought it was impossible. Um, now, you know, looking back on it, I realized that most of them were well-intentioned. Some of them definitely weren't, but, but they were, most of them were well-intentioned and they were just seeing things the way they knew how, the, how to see things. And I think that we forget that all of us to some extent I mean, really just look at things from the from our own lens, our own perspective. You know, we're all biased in some way. And I think that's an important thing to keep in mind when getting feedback on your educational journey, um, whether it's private school, public school, um, on-schooling, homeschooling, world schooling, whatever it is. I think it's important to keep that in mind and not take everything so seriously, you know, in, in, term, in that sense. Um, I mean, I would say I would also recommend sort of just following your interest and being okay with that, even if that leads you to some places that might be unpredictable, might not make sense to a casual observer, um, might not even make sense to you at first. Like guitar, for instance, I, I didn't even listen to music really before I started playing guitar. Um, and, you know, I'm a professional musician now, and I don't really see it as that strange, where some people might might see that as, you know, how on earth, you didn't right? grow up with music um, <laughs> right so I, I would i would say that just you know keep an open mind follow your interests follow your heart um and i mean other than being a good person really i hope i hope people have the freedom to explore what they're interested in 
<laughs> yeah, I know when I when I talk to unschoolers, um, one of the common things that I hear is that it really like the big value was that you found something that you could be passionate about and you got good at it because you were passionate about it. You like you could spend hours upon hours upon hours upon hours doing this thing. Yeah. Unschoolers also know the value of time um, mm. as a commodity. And I think that that's also like a really great um, benefit to this whole world of untraditional schooling, um, that you see time as a commodity. Yes, money is a commodity, but time is also a commodity. And the time you spend doing things, the time you spend um, honing your craft, the time you spend with other people is really, really valuable. Uh, anything else that you want to add that we didn't address? Uh, what, yeah, one thing I will add is that you know, people talk about homeschoolers, they're different, as if that's a bad thing. Well, the interesting thing is, is that in school, you know, we're taught traditional schools, from what I understand as a substitute teacher and from observation, people are taught to conform, you know, they're taught to follow the herd, but then they grow up and employers and job interviews, what do they ask you? What are your strengths? What makes you different? Well, how can you develop that if you're forced to conform for 12 or 18 years or however long? And so I think that's been a huge benefit, just general life benefit for me. Like being different myself, I can respect the differences of others a lot more easier than if I was forced to be like everyone else. The different thing is interesting, right? Because we always talk about like, like we've mentioned quirky and we've mentioned mm -hmm. different. Um, but I think, yeah, I mean, unschoolers and, and people with non-traditional learning experiences should embrace those things and really um, I wish there was something like unschooler pride, right? Like Ben has written a, uh, like <laughs> unschooler yeah. pride, yeah. You've, you've written a, an essay on sharing your story. And I always talk about like how it's important for other unschoolers and it's important for untraditional schoolers to share their story. Um, I think we've, we have the story of the majority and now we need the story of those maybe who weren't involved in the majority. Um, so I think that's seems like, it seems like this is a, a subtle plug for the podcast. Yeah, it's a such a right. little bit, a little that's, bit. That's, little that's bit. what we're doing. Very good. Well, I, I enjoyed talking to, to both of you and uh, hearing about this experience. So it was really cool. Thank you for coming on. Thank you.